It's the orthodox ethos that matters. And this is grounded in not just 2,000 years of practice, which Metropolitan Loris, actually, as I discussed many times with him, uh, especially in my younger years in the seminary, I was very set on theology, theological points, uh, and points of ecclesiology. And Vladika would just kind of bear with me and listen to me, and, and he looked again, looked up again, and, and he very strictly said to me, first behavior, and then theology. If you're not Orthodox, the only question of union is you must become Orthodox. That's, that's the way you have union with Roman Catholics and Protestants. You baptize them. One of our former Metropolitans, Metropolitan Vitali, Ustino said one of the great illnesses of the 20th century is the weakness in the understanding of ecclesiology in the church. What are the boundaries of the church? And as you know, that the Russian Orthodox Church, through the grace of God, produced the anathema against ecumenism in order to bring to people's attention that like every family, every organization, no matter what it is, community has boundaries. One of the clergymen told me, he said, you probably think that people come to, to, to orthodoxy for X number of reasons. And one of the reasons is because they're looking for something conservative. And I said, well, yes, because we are against these things. This is why a lot of people convert. He says, that's true. They want something conservative, but rarely do they want something traditional. And all of a sudden I realized that there's a difference between just conservative and traditional. And many people who are satisfied with conservative don't want anything to do with traditional because it's too foreign to them. But you really can't have orthodoxy without traditionalism. One of the things that I discovered that a monk must be, and one of the virtues who he, which, which he must attain to it, and that's for all Orthodox Christian, and that is holy simplicity, grace-filled simplicity. And I'm not talking about simpletons. This is a real, like, humility, patience. And how am I going to be simple 
how can I possibly do with the, all this in my mind, like like steel, a steeled mind is what. It, and I read somewhere, do attach yourself to a pious, simple person. And and what happened was I was assigned to the garden, and the gardener was monk Germagen, who's of course gone now. He was a simple Ukrainian peasant who was in exile also in Canada, and he was either ran or was part of a raspberry farm. And he came to Jordanville, he was a monk, and he did our gardening, the vegetable gardens. And this was my, my first obedience. So I thought to myself, all right, Father Gim again will be my elder. I will do everything he tells me to do. I will think like he thinks. I will act like he thinks. Everything, I will just, Mimic because that's the way it begins. You begin by habit, by imitating, and then you know the the soul takes its tone from the body. So I'm out there, and he says, "Here, take this hoe and go down these rows." And I'm out there with all my education, out there hoeing and and doing these things. And it, it went on and on and like this. And after a while, the steel started. To, it got softer. Orthodoxy has always expressed itself through the life of people. The first orthodoxy was thoroughly Jewish. There's no way around it. The holy apostles preferred Jewish food, Jewish customs, Jewish traditions. They were Jews, traditionally Jews. That's the only reason why St. Timothy was ordained uh, as a bishop, such a young bishop, because he had a good Jewish pious upbringing. And then, of course, orthodoxy sanctified wherever it could to some degree, the culture in the different countries where missionary work was being done and people were converted. But you, it's impossible to separate. And this is where tradition begins to develop. Wherever a person is converted, they'll never, I'll never be a Romanian. But if I was literally forced into some reason to live in the Romanian church in Romania, I would do things the way the Romanians do it and not try to do it any other way. Because this is the way it's done. It's a way of life. When you're Romania, you do as the Romanians do. You know, uh, this is, has to be, this is traditional versus conservative. You know, we're against abortion, we're against gay marriage, we're against, yes, 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 that's all true, but it's more than that. It's more than just the way you think. It's the way, the rhythm of your life. Catechism is not just for inquirers to begin and catechumens to complete so that they might be ready for holy baptism. Catechism is for all Christians. I've always stayed here at this beautiful conference center next to priests on the left and the right mm. and uh, standing in church with 300 priests and chanting. And here we are with mixed company mm. and families. Uh, mm. it's, a, it's a different experience for me here at the village, but so far it's been extremely edifying. Our responsibility is to carry the light of Christ into the world. You know, I think this moment is special. Uh, I've only been Orthodox since 1993, and I've never seen the level of interest uh, genuine interest in Holy Orthodoxy that I see now. It's very important to help people who are trying to become Orthodox Christians. I have a meeting before I enroll someone as a catechumen and I, have, I ask them important questions. And I also make a few assertions that I know are gonna shape their mind. One of those assertions is, this is the most important thing you will ever do in your entire life. It's more important than who you get married to. Catechism is it's a serious process. It's something that we have since our founding in 1992 mm -hmm. taken very seriously. My predecessor, Father Paul Finley, was a very serious catechist himself. And uh, when I came in 1998 to St. Andrew Parish, the parish was ready. They were ready to engage the whole parish to help mm -hmm. work together to do catechism. And God has been sending people to us, but never like today. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm glad that you've asked me to speak about this topic because I think it's in my ministry, it's never been more important than mm. today. Hippolytus's apostolic tradition, paragraph 16, lists the professions which disqualified one from being a catechumen. In that pagan milieu, which, forgive me, was a lot closer to orthodoxy than the secular milieu. At least the pagans believed in the divine realm. Okay, at least they believed in the divine I, I've stopped. I've stopped myself, and I like to stop people with a smile, when 
Orthodox Christians call certain practices in America pagan. I'm like, don't say that. That's an insult to the pagans. <laughs> there are more people seeking the truth, wanting to know Christ, wanting to put their feet in the stability of the church since the winds are blowing mm. so aggressively. Mm. They're falling over. They're either going to fall over and lose everything, as they mm. see many people doing, or they're going to put their feet in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, grow deep roots, bear beautiful fruit for the glory of God, and be saved. The Christian life is the life of perpetual illumination, of unending discipleship. In St. Paul's words to the Corinthians, of taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. This is the Christian life. And this magnificent text presents the two sides of Orthodox Catechism, the destruction of evil thoughts and the upbuilding of the faith. I would say the first thing that we have to do is open our eyes up to what the church is. Right. And amongst other things, and of course, just the New Testament itself describes the church under at least 30 different images. <laughs> the yes. church can't, it shares in Jesus' incomprehensibility as his body, you can't just make a simple definition of the church. But amongst what she is, uh, is she's apostolic. Yes. And to be apostolic means not just that you're rooted and based upon the faith of the apostles, who are the foundation stones of the church, Jesus being the cornerstone, yes. and we being living stones, building up this body of Christ. But we inherit and continue their mission, the mission that is representative of the heart of God, who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten mm. son, that whoever believes in him might not perish but live forever. This is God's heart for the world. He yearns for the world, mm. and he yearns for the world through us. We deal with the devil in catechism directly by two means, by the refutation of heresy and by exorcism. These are the great weapons of the church to free catechumens from the clutches of the evil one. The call for the church, if we want to reach our land, if we want to glorify God by helping people know him, we have to be invested first and foremost in actually living the life of repentance and faith. The devil is a master catechist. He's the one behind every heresy, every false teaching, all manner of destructive ideology. This is what St. Paul writes to his spiritual son, Timothy. He says, the spirit explicitly says, that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and the doctrines of demons. Few distinguish, few distinguish between orthodoxy and heresy, truth and delusion. Augustinos Cantiotes says this. He says, heresy is the poisonous food of the soul. It is adulteration of salvific, redeeming medicines. It's the stealing of the sacred deposit it's the counterfeiting of the coins of truth, the perversion of the perfect, the deviation from the correct line which the word of God inscribes. Heresy is the acceptance of religious ideas which the church condemns as false and are set against her correct faith. Heresy is a crime against the validity and authenticity of the church which Christ established as the pillar and ground of the truth. But the world today doesn't pay attention to the seriousness of the danger that comes from heresy. This too is a sign of the times. O oh world, you pay attention to the small things. You're careful that the milk you drink is genuine, that your food is pure, that it's filled with vitamins, that your medicines are active, that your coins and paper currency are not counterfeit, that your archeological monuments not suffer the smallest corruption, that the means of transportation by which you make your trips, that they do not deviate from the lines. You're careful about all things except one thing, orthodoxy. I often have meetings with catechumens who once they discover Holy Orthodoxy, they're on fire. And of course, they want their loved ones to know. If it's a husband, he wants his wife. If it's a wife, she wants her husband. If it's parents, they want their children, etc. Yes. And they'll, they'll come and they'll ask me, as I'm sure they ask all over the world, they ask priests this question, what can I do? How can I get my spouse to come? How can I get my kids to become Orthodox? And as you said, we have to get out of the way. This is what I tell them. I said, look, if you really want to bring your spouse, then your orthodoxy will prove itself in the change of your life. According to St. Hippolytus's apostolic tradition, this is around 215 AD, <clears throat> he says this, quote, catechumens shall continue to hear the word for three years. But if a man is keen and perseveres well in the matter, the time shall not be judged, but only his conduct. So it's not so much that they have to do this long, 
It's the time necessary to become formed, to be ready. They're entering into a relationship of discipleship with Christ, right? Just to be a disciple, a mafitis, literally means a student, mm. right? You're going to be a pupil of the Master Christ, not just during your catechism, for your whole life. Mm. So I, I try to encourage the catechumens, get settled in this position because you're never going to leave it. Mm. Catechism is not just for the inquirer to make them a catechumen or for the catechumen to make them baptized. Yes. Catechism is for every Orthodox Christian for their whole life. And so you see, dear ones, from the beginning to the end, from the very enrollment of catechism until the completion of the rites of initiation, the Church delivers us by the almighty power of the Holy Trinity from the powers of the devils. Catechism is, from beginning to end, about deliverance from Satan. The Church is eternity in the here and now of human history. The Church is the bridge between our lives in history and our lives in eternity. Eternity is made manifest to us in the church. At the end of history, there will be a man, a world ruler, who will reign over all the world, or most of it. And this man is the Antichrist. Many heterodox Christians, unfortunately, uh, are under the delusion that Christ will come again within the ranks of human society, mm. the way he did before. The Orthodox Church has always considered that to be a heresy. He comes in the capacity of Jesus Christ. He is a fraud. Antichrist will draw in these heterodox Christians, and he will also fulfill many of the prophecies of Judaism as the awaited Judaic Messiah. We tend to think of Antichrist as a great warmonger, a tyrant. And indeed, in time, he will be a tyrant. But he begins as, in many ways, as Christ did. Someone meek, someone seeking justice, speaking truth to power. And it is only when he ensnares the world that he begins his great final persecution of God's church on earth. There will be an alliance of many Jews and heterodox Christians. It's already happening. It's already happening. Uh, we sometimes call it Judeo-Christianity. And so through history in the West, we see progressive heresies develop. Antichrist will rule a unified world civilization. Furthermore, there is something you may be aware of in the pipeline called a central bank digital currency whereby all private bank accounts will be held at a central bank and can be turned off or on depending on how you please the state. We in orthodoxy are very sensitive, or should be very sensitive, to the efforts to pull all religions together. Antichrist unlocks the mystery to what ecumenism is all about. Ecumenism is the globalization of religion, the pulling together of different Christian denominations, and even melding them with other religions like Islam and Hinduism and so on, on the belief that they're all legitimate paths to God. The fathers tell us that, again, he will come in the capacity of the Judaic Messiah, mm -hmm. and he will come in the capacity of Christ come again, fraudulently. The Antichrist will officially declare the advent of a new age on earth, which will succeed the Christian age, possibly creating a third covenant. We have the Old Testament, the New Testament, and he will create a third. This Cacodox doctrine about a third covenant is very old. Saint Gregory the theologian refers to this. Don't let this surprise you, the elder says, because it is what we are witnessing in our days. The Antichrist will change times and law. We're seeing that in our very days. God never fails to present saints at every century. 
So people will not say that sainthood was something of the old and near, something old. We have saints at every century in, thir in, in orthodoxy. Metropolitan Neophyto says, God is preparing us for what's coming. And the worst type of globalization, he says, is religious globalization. We have economic, social, we have ideological, and of course, for all that to work, we also need religious globalization. And that's not going to work. All the healing comes from Christ and from his church. Getting to know Father Peter here is more. He knows that every time I meet him, I will always tell him, I hope people will persecute you more. <laughs> if a person is unrepentant, therapy is not possible. That's why the Lord in all the miracles would always say, how would you like me to do to what do you think in what way do you think I can heal you? Mm. The Lord is first extending the hand, Lord heal me. But the healing of the Lord will first start with confession. Piety is not something we learn by ourselves. It is taught to us. But the teaching about piety is kind of painful because we have to lose the old part of ourselves. That's why the holy mystery of baptism is very important because in the holy mystery of baptism, we are reminded that we are the new person in Christ, which makes things easier. We can only be totally healed through Christ mm -hmm. because He's the only one who is life, the giver of life. He's the only truly healed one. Yes, yes. He's the only truly healed one. That's why He can impart healing to us. A person who would like to pray should first know himself because upon knowing himself, he will get to know the mercy of God. Some people think that they can repent, but they don't want to suffer. Mm. Some people, they enjoy suffering, without repentance, mm. but this goes two ways. We cannot talk about piety in this conference if we, in the deepest part of our hearts, maintain hatred, animosity against those who have sinned as if they are not part of the church. Stand firm in the faith. But the problem is that we cannot stand firm in the faith if we have a misguided morality ourselves. Do you think that uh, the topics we're talking about here are really vital to the church? I do. I think it's, I and mean, this is very important. I think in our times, and this is a great thing that we have to be watchful of and aware of. You can keep your outward expression fine. Keep it. Keep your cassocks, keep your vestments keep your liturgy, as long as you change your heart. I think the Lord gives us a mandate in our times, and mm -hmm. the times to, to, to know the signs of the times, yeah. so that we can Absolutely. be vigilant, so we can, we can be watchful. The scriptures say that we have to be watchful. The mm -hmm. Lord warns of, of all these things precisely because the counter is we can we can fall asleep, we can be lulled to sleep, and we can we can think that we're we're advancing in the things of God when actually we're not. Mm. And I think that's mm. um, a fearful thing. Saint Dimitri of Rostov says he says mankind will be united to someone. He says we will either be united spiritually to Christ or we will become one with the demons. 
I think it's important that that people are able to understand the times, especially within the Christian context. Mm -hmm. And and we have obviously, I mean, Orthodoxy has all the mechanisms to do that. We're the mm -hmm. only ones that can successfully do that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I came out of evangelical Protestantism. They don't have that. I want to read again from St. Seraphim of Vyritsa. He has this important quote that many of you may know already. He says, the time will come when there will be no persecution, but money and attractions of this world will draw people away from God, and many more souls will perish than during the period of open militant atheism. On the one hand, they will raise up crosses and gilt cuplas, but on the other hand, the kingdom of lies and evil will come. For the true church will always be persecuted and salvation will only be possible through sorrows and illness. Persecutions will take on a very refined and unpredictable character. You can say maybe we experienced a little foretaste of that. We have to uphold the truth of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ in the times in which he has put us so that we can also hopefully be counted as his disciples, as weak and feeble as we may be. The Lord's not looking to destroy us. The Lord's looking Absolutely. to heal us and to save us. And so whenever he reveals, even in our own lives, whenever he reveals those things, things that maybe we didn't even know were there previously, he's only doing that so we can come Absolutely. willingly to him and say, Lord, please, Take this, please yeah. heal this, Ma yeah. make me whole. I was just a surfer in California. I didn't know much better. You know, I thought it was all about babes and surfing and just getting what you could, you know? That's what I was kind of raised as in a Protestantism. It doesn't have much of a mechanism to really help you out of that. There's no ascetic life. There's no, you know, you can love Jesus, but there's there's no methodology. There's no way to really transform the inner man, to know your passions, to be set free through repentance. But we have that in orthodoxy. We have the answer. We have the cure because it is the church. It is the only church. There is no other church besides the orthodox church. It is the only place where mankind can find life and renewal. The devil's always taking things, it seems like the gospel and he's inverting it yes. like with Antichrist. And, and people want to be saved. I think we've mentioned that here at this conference. And, and people want paradise, we want all of these things, but we just don't want it through God's paths. Mm. God says repent, and we don't, I don't want to repent. I don't want to have to take up the cross right. and follow him. So I want paradise without Christ. I want salvation without Christ. I want Christ without Christ. The church is not run off of public opinion, nor is it run by the CDC. It is run by our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ.
Αυτά μου τα είπε ο Άγιος Ιάκωβος. Τι είναι ορθόδοξον ήθος. Να μαθητεύεις δηλαδή σε Αγίους. Και να περιμένεις, να θέλεις να γίνεις μαθητής Αγίων. Και θα φροντίσει το Άγιο Πνεύμα. Πώς θα γίνει αυτή η μαθητεία. Μην πιέζεις τα πράγματα. Πηγαίνω στα κατεχόμενα όπως ξέρετε από καιρού εις καιρό γιατί η μισή μου Μητρόπολη είναι κατεχόμενη από τα στρατεύματα των Τούρκων και η πόλη τη Μόρφου είναι κατεχόμενη. Μερικοί είτε τουρκοκύπροι είτε έπικοι θέλουν να γνωρίσουν την Ορθοδοξία. Δεν λέω ότι είναι προσήλυτη, ε, είναι καλοπροαίρετη απέναντι στην Ορθοδοξία. Μου λέει ένας, σε παρακαλώ νεόφιτε, την επόμενη φορά που θα έρθεις είχα πάει μια εικόνα της Παναγίας δώρο και του άρεσε πολύ. Θέλω να μου φέρεις και έναν εφηρμοσμένο Ευαγγέλιο. Πρώτη φορά είχα ακούσει αυτόν τον όρο εφηρμοσμένο Ευαγγέλιο. Του λέω τι είναι το εφηρμοσμένο Ευαγγέλιο. Αυτός δεν ήξερε πολλά ελληνικά, εγώ δεν ήξερα πολλά αγγλικά. Πρέπει να κάνουμε ερμηνεία μέχρι να βρούμε τους λόγους των όντων. Λοιπόν, λέει, όταν ένας χριστιανός πάρει στα σοβαρά το Ευαγγέλιο και αρχίσει να το εφαρμόζει κατά γράμμα τι γίνεται ο χριστιανός λέω του γίνεται άγιος Α, θέλω μου λέει το life τη ζωή ενός Αγίου η μάνα μου μου έλεγε η μιλιά η Αγία πρόσεχε γέ μου να μην γύρει ο νους σου Ό,τι και να γίνεις, όπου και να πας. Αν δεν το καταλάβουμε αυτόν και ότι ο Ορθόδοξος Χριστιανός το ήθος του πρώτα και κύρια είναι να παρακολουθεί την καρδιά του. Τι λογισμούς έχει, τι επιθυμίες έχει και αμέσως με γρήγορο νου, σόφρονα λογισμών, καρδία νύφουσα, να μετανιώνει ότι το πρωταρχικό μας έργο είναι αυτόν. Λοιπόν, εάν δεν ασχοληθούμε με τη θεραπευτική αγωγή της καρδιάς μας, δεν θα αποκτήσουμε ορθόδοξον ήχος. Yet another friend is a living icon. Yes, I said living. A true personification of Orthodox ethos. A true example of the Orthodox phronima, which the Holy Spirit has given to us through the lives and teachings of our Holy Church Fathers. For over one dozen years, he was in strict ascetic guidance of St. Joseph the Hesychus, he was blessed by God to incarnate the foundation of Orthodox ethos, repentance, 
perfect obedience and total surrender of his will to Christ through his spiritual father. In one of Yeru's sermons on abortion, he called abortion the atomic bomb of sin. And he said, I confessed a woman that committed 50 abortions. And everyone went, oh. and then he pointed the finger and he said, don't be amazed at the sin. Be amazed at God's mercy because he forgave her. Our words are often flabby and weak. For the word to be passed on, for the word to give life, it must have flesh. When along with your word you give your flesh and blood to others, then and only then do your words mean something. Fortunate is the man who is broken in pieces and offered to others, who is poured out and given to others to drink. When his time of trial comes, he will not be afraid. He will have nothing to fear. He will have already understood that in the celebration of love, man is broken, but not divided, eaten, and never consumed. By grace, he has become Christ. My beloved brothers and sisters in our Lord Jesus, yet a friend, because of being an, in unceasing prayer, was in a state of almost constant illumination, and sometimes even in the ineffable state of theosis. Therefore, he becomes for us a living example of what it means not just to read the gospel, but to become the gospel. When I began to look at the actual statements of the Holy Fathers and of the ecumenical councils, I began to see that uh, while the primacy of Rome was acknowledged, there was no indication of universal jurisdiction. As a matter of fact, quite a lot of contradictory evidence mm -hmm. that indicated that the Pope of Rome never had and never claimed universal jurisdiction over the entire church. and nor did was it ever understood that he was an infallible voice and that this actually obviously contradicted the statements in Vatican I and Vatican II and called into question the entire doctrine of the uh, authority of the Pope as the Catholic Church defines it. It suddenly occurred to me, and this is something for which I'm grateful to God, that there was nothing that the, there was a conflation that the Catholic apologists were committing that they never acknowledged, and I don't think they're even aware of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I hope someday to be able to have a conversation with some of them and really ask them if they're aware that they seem to be conflating primacy with universal jurisdiction and infallibility. And so, in other words, they would see texts in the first millennium of the Church's existence and they would see texts from the Holy Fathers acknowledging the primacy of Rome and use that text as proof of universal jurisdiction and infallibility. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I suddenly thought, this, this, this is not legitimate. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to take for granted that there's universal jurisdiction implied in the primacy, especially when you have phenomena like the Pope Gregory the Great saying, Gregory the Dialogist saying there's no uh, universal bishop. Pope Francis is uh, clearly not an Orthodox Christian. 
Mm. I mean, in the sense of even holding to the Roman Catholic faith. Mm. So uh, he's just, uh, and and that's so strange, you know. I, I remember seeing a few years ago that uh, a, a Roman Catholic parish near where I lived here, they uh, somebody went and I had the, I was get handed the bulletin and it said they're going to have a Pope Francis study group. And I thought, why would anybody want to? St he, you study what this man says, and you're going to be straying farther and farther from the Christian faith. Mm. And this, yeah. this is an indication of the de the dangers of this entire idea of authority. Phronima is a Greek word that expresses a worldview. The Orthodox phronima is a, a an expression of the Orthodox Christian worldview. It affects our initiation and response to the issues of life in this world, and they are spiraling down into hell in our time. The significance of defining the goal of our salvation and the means of working it out with fear and trembling cannot be overemphasized. In Matthew it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. We are to become the fullness of the image of Christ. Our salvation primarily, almost exclusively, is about being conformed to the image of the Creator, Christ our God and Savior. We're supposed to be a new human race. The will of God existing forever has been to bring about the created realm. He just didn't figure this out about three eons ago, forever. There was never and ever that that wasn't the will of God, to bring about the created realm, including the angelic world, the physical and spiritual dimensions, and then to join the physical and spiritual dimensions in one creature, in the human being, composed of body and soul, the soul having noose. This noose is so critical in Christian anthropology that in the scripture it's even mentioned uh, several times as spirit. Body, soul, and spirit. We are, we are not three pieces and parts, we're two, body and soul. The noose is such a critical noetic faculty of the soul that it is specifically named the spirit. The soul, having noose and a rational mind, is in the image of the creator God. The noose is the spiritual portal of the soul that receives uncreated light. And I'm not talking about just a descriptive phrase, I'm talking about real stuff, stuff that holds all other stuff together. Uncreated light, divine energy, uncreated power. The noose was meant to receive divine light similarly to the physical eye receiving created light. The soul receives uncreated energy and participates in the life-giving power of God spiritually transmitting that life to the physical body as well. Our body will participate eternally in this process. Human beings were meant to receive uncreated light, spiritually photosynthesize it, and have spiritual and physical life joined together. What we learn in the Orthodox faith is that grace is divine power. Grace is divine energy. It's uncreated light. It visited us this morning in the liturgy. Those of you who received communion received it into your bodies. The kingdom of God is in power. If you want to receive the kingdom of God, you receive divine energy. When the Lord said, there are those sitting here, standing here, that won't see death until they see the kingdom of God. Within the next few days, he took them to the Mount of Transfiguration. And what did they see? The kingdom of God, divine energy. Our faith is not about information. Our faith is about transformation. The acquisition of the Orthodox ethos presupposes then an encounter with the one who is the life of the world, and thus, it is a matter of salvation, and hence absolutely inseparable from dogma. And I could stop here and you would have your answer to all of the moralisms. You do realize that we are, we are surrounded by Christianity, which is essentially moralistic. That it's about being externally good, appearing good, doing good works, being a good person, being a good citizen. 
None of that is Christianity. You know, somebody said recently, ah, oh, ecumenism's dead, it's not, it doesn't, there, there's no ecumenism today, it doesn't exist. And they, what they probably meant, and this is a venerable, you know, venerable friend and father, uh, what they probably meant is that, that WCC, uh, you know, old style ecumenism, that we saw in the 60s and 70s and big meetings and that, that's kind of dead. But that doesn't mean ecumenism is dead at all. They've gone beyond that. Now they're doing pan-religious ecumenism. Has anybody paid attention to what happened a few weeks ago in uh, Kazakhstan? I mean, that's where we're at. Now we progress beyond that old, stale, tried, conservative WCC and we're in the unity of, uh, you know, we're in perennialism. We're in universalism, we're, but we're way beyond old style limited to Protestant, you know, uh, uh, style uh, ecumenism. So uh, ecumenism is alive and well, and it's going to, it's, Elder Athanasius was very clear, it's going to guide us to the Antichrist. Without the missionary project of the 19th century, the Protestants, we cannot really speak about globalization today. They took the English language, they took the Western culture, along with their understanding of the gospel, and they went all over the world, into the far reaches of Africa and Asia and South America, and they brought with them a false Christ, but a Western culture, which then set the stage for a unity on a global scale. So if anyone wants to say, but they've done such missionary work, think about it more deeply. What are the fruits of that? Not just the name of Christ being heard, is this the mission that, that, that has to happen before the end of the world? This Christ that they preached? No. The Orthodox Gospel must be preached to the ends of the world before the end. It's not an accident in our day that many people want to throw away the canons. Uh, this is the ethos. And they ignore the, con the conciliar decisions, which is the boundaries of the church. These things are inseparable, and both of them become very tiresome for the secular Christian but also for many deluded Christians who do not understand the dogmatic, do not have the dogmatic consciousness of the church. One of the greatest threats to the church in the diaspora today is not ecumenism with the papal Protestants, but with the Monophysites. We have many Orthodox Christians of very good disposition who believe that the Copts and the Armenians and the other Monophysites are Orthodox. Who taught them that? What father taught that? What ecumenical council said that? How is it possible that committees are running the Orthodox Church and telling us what we believe? Speak out. Right before you, the Lord has given you an opportunity to become confessors of the faith. Why are you running from it? It's a path of sanctification. Do you know that? It's, an, it's one of the easier paths, frankly, of all the sanctification is to say the truth. You can go on a mountaintop and fast night and day, or you can say, I'm a Christian. I don't believe in this. I resist it. Now, should you flee from a spiritual father who is teaching heresy? Yes. Should you flee from a jurisdiction? No. Why? Because you're going to go to another jurisdiction. By the way, that's in the church, and you're in the church. They're both the church. Unless you want to flee to a zealot schismatic group, but then you're leaving the church. So the jurisdiction hopping, I don't, you can only do that, by the way, in America and the West. If you're in Greece, there is no other jurisdiction to hop to, right? So you got to stand and confess. Saint of Sophroni now of Essex says, any and every dogmatic error will inevitably reflect on one's spiritual life. So if you depart out of pride and arrogance, which is behind every heresy, behind every heretic and behind every heresy, is pride, according to St. John Climacus. If you depart from the dogmas, you think better than, you know better than the church, you don't submit yourself to Christ, but you create and you resist, resist the church and the tradition of the church, you will lose the ethos. It's a matter of time. St. John Chrysostom, he speaks about how orthodox doctrines protect us from the demons. Exactly, when you turn away from orthodox dogmas, what happens? You're exposed to the demons. He says, but not so among the saints, or rather not even among us sinners. For although our practice is beyond endurance, yet because God, by God's grace we cling with much exactness to the doctrines of the truth, 
We are above the malice of the evil spirits. Cling to the orthodox dogmas. Do not doubt in your heart the truth of the orthodox faith. Submit yourself to the fathers. Crucify your intellect. When you stand and doubt this or that, church father, know that it's the demon speaking to you, wanting to take you away and to make you easy prey and take you away from the grace of God. As St. Theodokos of Fortiki says, the Holy Spirit before baptism works on the outside and the demonic energies are within. After baptism, the opposite happens. And now we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within. That shows us that there's a demarcation line. There's a boundary that one has to pass in order to have the Holy Spirit working within you. Doesn't mean he's not working. He's working throughout all of creation, but it's not gonna, there's obviously the presence of the Holy Spirit. Is it absent from hell? Does hell have the Holy Spirit? What do you think? Is there anywhere that the Holy Spirit does not go? No. What makes it hell then? They reject the Holy Spirit. When heresy is preached, what does it mean? We see in the Orthodox Church today, there are, there are hierarchs that are preaching heresy. It's not hard at all. Just turn on the internet and go to Facebook and you can find a number of examples. What does it mean? Is it the beginning of the apostasy or the end? What do you think? It's the manifestation that long before they lost the Holy Spirit. They lost the ethos, they turned away, and then they were left to the delusion and it eventually manifested itself. Why is the church so strict with heresy? Because they understand this. It's already lost it. They might still take, be in the position of the bishop and the mysteries and the grace of God might still work through them not because of them, in spite of them, but for the faithful, because the mysteries are not given by the bishop or the priest, but by Christ. One must ground himself thoroughly within the holy tradition, the holy fathers, the holy ecumenical councils, the holy canons. They must move beyond learning about Christ, the horizontal plane, the, na the knowledge on the rational level of being. You must move beyond that if you're going to Ground yourself thoroughly in the holy tradition. To living life in Christ, submitting yourself fully to the person of Christ, you have to gain knowledge by your experience of Jesus Christ. You have to gain experience. You have to struggle. Violence against the old man. People come and say, I have this, I'm, I can't do this, I'm tired. What should I do, Father? Violence against the old man. Father Peter and the team and our expectations for the uh, were here, and what we met was here. And having Bishop Luke was an amazing uh, blessing, and all the speakers. At a conference like this, you can talk about, I think, sort of broader issues um, that might uh, not get treatment at a local parish level. Focus on your baptism. That's very important because you sign up to this marriage. Marriage leads to the cross. The cross is you have to deny yourself. And through this denial, there's going to be suffering and affliction. No matter what you do, it's always going to be suffering. It's always going to be affliction. And um, you have to carry that burden. And uh, what you hear in the conference is uh, if you keep complaining, complaining, and complaining, God might take away that affliction, but then you lose crowns. You might lose your reward in heaven because you, we don't want easy lives. Um, you hear Archbishop Verki's struggle for virtue, it's all it's about asceticism. It's, it's about focusing on God. And what does it mean to focus on God? Is just uh, you have to focus on what he says. Epistle of St. Paul is uh, be perfect. You put on Christ, you deny the old man. My key takeaway from this whole day was having it centered around worship, right? You can't just talk about orthodox. You know, it has to be living the faith and worshiping God, because that's part of living the faith. So 
other than the fact that a lot of people are surprised, like, oh, this is like an actually an Athenite vigil going on here. It's you actually can feel the grace. Conferences provide us an opportunity with one another, and that's what we're trying to do. Why is it to have oneness of mind? Because after having oneness of mind, we will learn of brotherly love. Oneness of mind talks about proper doctrines, proper understanding of doctrine. When we have proper understanding of doctrine, we will have proper understanding of loving. <laughs> if all the orthodox hierarchs got together and told the local, state, and federal officials outside the, the borders of our church, we will try to get our people to follow your instructions. However, within the church, we will change nothing. We will not have social distancing. We will not wear masks. We will not change the way we give communion. And if you want to arrest us, do it. My feeling is if we did that, God would have ended it the next day. We are the true faith, and we had the opportunity to show the world that we are the true faith. Now, if this happens again, God forbid, I'm depending on my brother priest and you lay people. If the bishops close us down, we're going to stand outside the church or go in a home and we're going to tilt. We're not going to do this again. This cannot happen. <laughs> 